This week on CrossFeed, have a spot to tea and meet Jesus. UCC, unlimited condoms for Christ. Suing over singing. Have Jesus' lost years been found? And do you believe Satan is on TV? everyone, and a blessed Holy Week to you uh, from CrossFeed Religious News. I'm Pastor Dale Critchley, Pastor of St. Paul Lutheran Church in Delaware, Iowa. Yes, and a blessed Palm Sunday to all of you from St. Luke's Lutheran Church in Dedham, Massachusetts. I'm Pastor Jim Butler, and that's where I get to serve. So, so it's been an interesting week in Iowa. Um. We decided we wanted to copy Massachusetts, so yeah. I've uh, without going or such trends on our yes. I've, without going anywhere, I've moved closer to Jim. <laughs> That's right. And you did it the same way we did. Yeah, had a bunch of unelected, unaccountable judges making the decision. Now, in yeah. your case, of course, they completely upended a law that you guys had passed. You know, Magneto's right. There's a war coming. You know, the funny thing is, um, when Jim Nussel was uh, representative here, um, I sent him an email and said, um, you know, we really need a, a constitutional amendment to take care of all this. And he wrote me back and said, no, because it's not necessary. Hey, yeah. Well, Mr. Nussel, you know, he's he's from, well, he's, he's not from Manchester, but that was sort of his... Uh, base of operations is where his family lives and everything and um yeah i you know i i, I kind of feel like i know him in a sense but man he was wrong <laughs> i was reading online an article from the des moines register uh about this and uh the guy who's uh going to head up the uh, the uh, uh drive to set a constitutional amendment uh, said to, said that exact same thing. Said that um, you know they they wanted to do this a number of years ago, and they were said no, we have a law, uh, it's it's not necessary. But, and uh, you know now you know some of them are feeling very betrayed because yes, it was necessary. And they said the soonest it could be affected is 2012. Yeah, and then it has to be by a joint session of um, of our. Uh, legislators and both the Iowa Senate and House are uh are Democrat. So it's not happening. I mean do, do they have to have the majority say state in favor of it? Um yeah, I think so. Oh really because in Massachusetts they only have to have twenty five percent. Of course we can get twenty five percent, but that's all they need in order to pass it on for the people to vote on. So yeah, I'm not sure exactly how it works, but just the um yeah, the fact and they also said that, you know, given that um another three years will give people time to get used to it. And um you know, th that's gonna that's gonna affect it too. Although I I don't know. I mean, I'm sorry, but I'm not gonna get used to it. You know. Wrong is wrong and, and you don't get used to it. But well, a lot of people will. I mean, you know, you look at abortion. Of course, that's been 30 years. But, you know, nowadays a lot of people are used to it. Right. Well, the, the idea, you know, what the argument will be, you see, this hasn't hurt any families. And, of course, things like that always need to be, you know, seen as generations down. Uh, what's going to happen, though, is there's going to be somebody from Kansas or Missouri or a, uh, a Doma state uh, coming to Iowa. And just like they come into Massachusetts. And, um, <clears throat> you know, get married and then go back and sue to have it recognized under the um, uh, uh, whatever clause that is in the Constitution that recognizes marriages from other states. It's going to eventually wind up at the Supreme Court. Um, my guess is they'll go to the Ninth Circuit to uh, work and be from a Western state because the Ninth Circuit uh, tends to rule that way. Hmm. But they'll actually have to do it a couple different circuits. So that there's a, yeah. Um, so the, they, they begin, it, it'll wind up in the next 10 years at the Supreme Court level. 
It's frustrating, though. You know, you think in Iowa that you're not going to run into this kind of stuff. And it was unanimous in the Iowa Supreme Court, too. Yep. So, so yeah, you don't have to live on the coast to have to deal with this kind of stuff. So, nope. Enjoy yourself there. Yeah. Hey, think of all the money you can make. <laughs> so. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> oh. So. Oh, gosh. Let's, let's go on. Where, where should we start here tonight? Some of these things, stories are almost ridiculous. Yeah, a lot of them are. <laughs> Everybody bear with us. It's it's the beginning of Holy Week. And by the way, I'll tell you right now, we're not going to have an episode next week because we record on either Thursdays or Sundays. And that's Monday, Thursday and uh, Easter Sunday. And um, right. I'm, I'm actually not working on Monday, Thursday um, just because of the way we have it set up. The other pastor, uh, local pastor, is doing the service. I, Monday, Thursday is when I actually get to go and commune with my family. So, um, but, uh, yeah, I'll be at church, um, not here recording. So, um, let's, let's, okay. Well, let's talk about the lost years of Jesus. Okay. I mean, come on. <laughs> this, this, okay. All right. First of all, this is an article in, um, in the Huffington post. So that automatically, you know, kind of frames it. Okay. <laughs> You know, the, and it's it's by a director, movie director. Yeah, who, it, yeah. He he wrote his own article, and and they they published it as a um, a, a, you know, as as a news story. But really, if you actually read through it, it reads more like a press release. That's exactly all it is. Uh, and and he wrote it himself. Uh, but uh, yes, that that uh, he is. Um, for years, there has been discussion, uh, especially for New Age people, that Jesus had gone to India and spent part of that, that, that those silent years between the time he was 12 and, and uh, 30, it was 18 years. And so, yeah, here it is. He says, yes, he went to India and he's been sifting through the legends, myths and historical evidence. I like that um, to find out. Jesus about Jesus travels to India, and uh, you know now of course he says um, the fundamentalists. Uh, well, we simply say it's a part of God's life that uh, you don't need to know about. I mean, Jesus' life you don't need about. If God wanted you to know about it; He'd tell you about it. Well, yeah, He's got that right. But uh, <laughs> I'm not a fundamentalist. And that's what I say. <laughs> yeah, you know, I me too. You know, but. Uh, yeah, I like it. He says, yeah, the wise men were from the east. They were from Persia. Yeah, not India. Not India. Well, not uh, only that, I love how he says it, too. He really shows how learned he is. His wise men from the east who were present at Jesus' birth. <laughs> He's been watching too many Rankin Bass <laughs> episodes. <laughs> yeah, they helped deliver him. Yeah. Um, so, so yeah, they were there. So then, uh, why would the Lord not return the visit? Especially since the oldest temples in the world belonging to the oldest religions were in India. Yeah, because that's what Jesus was all about. <laughs> well, whatever religion happens to show up. Yeah. Um, I mean, this, this, I mean, who he's talking to, you know, uh, you know, uh, uh you know, uh, this person called it, uh, it said his thing was a, Calvocate of crackpots and pseudo history, ignoring that the film has such luminaries as the Dalai Lama, Princeton professor Elaine Pagels, two professors at Georgetown University, an apostolic nuncio of Paul, Pope John Paul II, and of course the historic interview with the Pope of Hinduism, who rather pointedly declares that Christian authorities have been guilty of a cover up. Um, you know, I wouldn't trust Elaine Pagel's scholarship. She's a new age wacko. I mean, yes, she teaches at Princeton. So does Peter Singer. I mean, you know, doesn't doesn't make. I mean, on the other hand, Bruce Metzger does. Now, if he was interviewing Bruce Metzger, that'd be different. Yep. yep. Uh, for those of you who don't know the name Bruce Metzger, uh, he is one of the world's leading authorities on textual criticism, 
a, a New Testament scholarship. He's just he's a world. I mean, if he if he was interviewed, then he might have a, a real scholar to talk to in New Testament circles. Um, but he doesn't talk to him. He talks to Elaine Pagels, who's uh, an editor of the Gnostic Gospels, and uh, you know. Well, and you know the Dalai Lama. He's a pretty good uh, authoritative source on uh, Christian history. Yep. Huh? <laughs> um, you know, it's 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 uh, yeah. You know, yeah, and, oh, and I like this other thing. I mean, yeah, it kind of shows you this guy's interest. You know, his 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 other um, uh, th- th- this fits in neatly with my other films, which are usually about crackpots who are gifted philosophers, artists, geniuses, and honorable men through the centuries, all of whom were considered outcasts in their time. They include Vincent Van Gogh, Timothy Leary. Okay, now there's a man that I, you know, I, I don't know if I would call him a philosopher, artist, genius, or honorable man. Uh, the guy who was, you know, experimented on LSD on people, you know. Um, well, Vincent Van Gogh, I mean, he, he, yeah, he was a really talented artist, but um, the guy was a crackpot, too. I mean, <laughs> I mean he was downright creepy. <laughs> So, I mean, you know, a lot of the digits are just, I don't know. I mean, well, here's another question I've got to ask. How does Jesus, you know, who, okay, he, he's lower middle class. I mean, he's, he's, he's a laborer. How, where does he get the money to travel to India? That was my question, too. Because <laughs> he says, but, well, you know, it was this is right on a trade route and everything uh, uh where is it here um where is it uh, the, the silk road to india and beyond was much traveled there were caravans of merchants yeah <laughs> but it still costs money to travel right is <laughs> there a reason that jesus stuck in the immediate vicinity of israel okay it's not the only reason i mean that's where his work was which of course brings up the other point that why would he go to India? You know, he, Jesus didn't come to earth to tour it. Okay. He knows the earth. He doesn't need to go on tour to see different places. All right. He created it. All right. <laughs> so, you know, why would that's, I mean, that's the whole thing that, that makes this whole thing so goofy is why would he go in the first place? You know, and, right. I, and why did he send St. Thomas to India? He didn't. The Holy Spirit sent St. Thomas to India, but Jesus didn't. <laughs> but that's another one that... Right. At least, you know, the Spirit moved Thomas to go there. And I guess if you take that review, you could say, you know, Jesus sent him there. But, uh, you know, it's not like, you know, he had a divine command saying, go to India. Uh, because that's where I, I spent time. Maybe he sent Thomas to India because people in India needed to know the gospel. Hmm. Uh, <laughs> you know, but uh, the the reality is, though, you know, he 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 just seems to think Jesus is some sort of rabbi or learner or something, and not a part of the um, whole gospel thing, and and, and it does not understand the divinity of Christ. But no, if I'm if I'm going to learn. My theology from someone, it would not be from a movie director <laughs> who considers Timothy Leary to be a, a gifted humanitarian and philosopher. And... <sighs> Let's move on. No, but if you really want to know about Jesus, you just yeah. got to drink the tea. <laughs> oh, good segue. Good segue. Oh, no, I like this church. Um, yeah, there's a, a, a uh, now this is under a few years ago. There was the religious um, religious freedom restoration act, and uh, which allows some different things to happen. And up in Portland, up in Oregon, uh, apparently there is a um, the Church of the Holy Light of the Queen, and they use a uh, stuff called Dami Dami D A I M E T. And it has a very uh, um, 
trace it has trace amounts of a uh, hallucinogenic in there, DMT, chemical DMT in it, and um, you know, and so they have a direct experience with Jesus. Yeah, yeah, they believe only by taking the tea. This is their sacrament. Um, is the only way you can have a direct experience with Jesus Christ. I think that I think Timothy Leary might be their patron saint. <laughs> Let me make one thing clear, okay? I'm drinking tea as we do this. <laughs> it's Earl Grey, okay? It's not, you know, dimey tea or whatever. <laughs> Probably make the show a whole lot more interesting, but, you know, especially for me. <laughs> wow, good effects, you know? So, um, you know, again, here... <laughs> The, 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 the fact that they're, you know, drinking, you know, this this hallucinogenic tea aside, it's interesting to me that, you know, you have to have this, you know, direct experience with Jesus. You know, Jesus in his word is not enough. Mm-hmm. Jesus, you know, in, 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 in the sacraments is not enough. You know, you got to have some sort of direct experience with Jesus. And it's, you know, only that can you, you know, truly, you know, know what Jesus is all about. Uh, of course, you know, it's whatever kind of hallucinations. Uh, like I said, this trace amount, so I don't know sure how strong, you know, you know, Obviously I don't know. strong enough. Yeah. I mean, but, you know, that's the, that's the whole thing that, that we're running into here is, all right, well, you know, God gave us the word, God gave us the sacraments, and there, that's how we can have a direct experience, um, so to speak, with Jesus, you know. He comes to us through those things. And, you know, and he says, take and drink, okay? But he says, take and drink, this is my blood, you know, which is shed for you for the forgiveness of sins, right? You don't need to, to have some sort of, um, some sort of experience with your five senses, um, you know, beyond your taste buds, I suppose, um, you know, to, to experience him. Because the point is, is that he says here, I am with you. All right. So if you believe that, then that should be good enough. But, you know, this is saying, no, God, what you gave us isn't good enough. All right. We've got to create a third sacrament um, to really be, you know, this is this is the way we want to experience you. You know, we don't want to experience you the way that you have given to us. So it's, you know, we're going to call the shots here, God. But you know, the, the, but then you know, that happens also within Christian teaching too. I mean, you know, part of it is um, when you get in group, charismatic groups and stuff like that. There, God's word's not enough. You got to have some sort of experience, and this experience then validates that God's word is true. Mm-hmm. You know, instead of God's word validating the experience, it's putting the cart before the horse. Right. And we need to to validate God's word. God's word is its own validation. God's word validates our experience. Right. And that yeah. goes with our experience. It goes with our reason. It goes with, you know, um, with uh, uh, tradition, you know, anything else. Anything else when you're talking about God, first you say, well, what does God have to say about himself? All right. right. Then beyond that, if we, you know, um, if we, well, if there's unanswered questions, they may just have to remain unanswered, you know. Um, but we, I mean, we use our reason to help us understand God's word. You know, we use our experiences but it's under to God's help word. us. Right. And this is, we've talked about this before, the magisterial and ministerial, that, um, that our reason, our experience, our traditions, it all serves God's word. It cannot dominate God's word. It can't come right. first. So, yeah, that's what you're right. And it can't come first and it can't be on an equal basis. Right. Um, you know, that's that's where Lutherans would disagree with, um, you know, uh, the Roman Catholics who put scripture and tradition on the same uh, uh, thing. Or we have uh, the famous Methodist quadrilateral, that it's scripture, tradition, experience, and reason. And you have a four-legged stool there that you sit on, and, and all of them are equal with each other. And uh, no, it's scripture alone, and everything else co- comes under that. Uh, we we say that scripture is the rule that rules. 
and everything else is a rule that is ruled by scripture. So I guess that would go for whatever things you find in, you know, hallucinogenic tea. Uh, I wonder if you would see Satan if you took this tea. (laughs) This is all right. uh, This is on Nightline. Um, There was a debate about the existence of Satan. All right. I, I, first off, I have to love this guy because I miss Ted Koppel. And I'll tell you, after reading this, if this is what Nightline has come to. Because, you see, I remember when I, – I, I'm old enough to remember when Nightline first got going. It was nightly updates on the Iranian hostage crisis. That was okay. – uh, that was uh, with Ted Koppel, and, and, and it evolved into its own great television show. So, And he used to have some great – um, debates. He used to have some great people on there. I, I, I just, I really got to expect, but my goodness. All right, we had on one side uh, the there is no Satan side, uh, Deepak Chopra, and uh, Bishop Carlton Pearson, the former evangelical turned atheist or turned universalist. All right. And then on the Satan Exists side was Pastor Mark Driscoll and Annie Lobert, uh, the ex-prostitute who now heads Hookers for Jesus. So we've got a real think tank here. (laughs) (laughs) Um, Yeah. So, um, you know, he he says, and and this is a blog article, there is a link in the article if you want to read the actual... um, uh, transcript, but um, this is no offense to the sincerity or intelligence of any of them, but is that the group you'd choose for an informative and uplifting discussion about the intricacies of Christian theology? And he's exactly right. Um, okay. Well, let, 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 let me say this. Okay. What I put um, 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 Annie Lobert, no. Deepak Chopra, probably not. Now, Mark Driscoll, he he calls him hip conservative pastor. He's the founder of Mars Hills Church, one of the pastors there. Uh, he Driscoll is is nobody's fool. Why he was on this, I don't know, but he is not a dumb guy. He is quite bright. Uh, I mean, in he, his church, he he. People who've gone there and some of the sermons I've read, they're they're, they're intellectually very heavy, um, and so it's it's I uh, so I he he'd be a person yes I think you could have a, a scholarly debate with. Would you take pride in being an insufferable know it all? You know, I mean, it, I I thought this the um, the article itself, the the blog article, you know, just did a really nice job. Of, of handling this, of discussing it, and just pointing out, he says, a debate requires two sides who agree on some fun- fundamental common ground, but who disagree about other items. In this co- case, there could be no common ground on the one essential issue. One side believes the Bible's the literal, the literal word of God, and then if Satan is in the text, that's proof enough, or that identifying one's experience of evil as satanic is proof that your interpretation is correct. The other side believes that parts of the Bible may be sacred, but cannot be taken literally, and that one's understanding of experience can contain errors. So, you know, it's, Satan's real. No, it isn't. Is too. Is not. You know, (laughs) it's kind of, it's kind of where they hit. So I I like the, um, the, one of the comments uh, in it that said uh, that a better choice for the debate would be Richard Dawkins and Ravi Zacharias. And I couldn't agree more. I thought, yeah, that would be a good debate. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I, I've never heard of, um, and I've never heard of this Bishop Carlton Pearson either. Yeah, me either. Uh, uh, but uh, you know, but yeah, I, the, you know, ex-prostitute with hookers for Jesus. I mean, <laughs> okay. You know. Right, you know, she's. I'm. I'm sure she's an intelligent woman. I mean, she's. She's organized this. Um, this organization. You know, she does good work. We've talked about this organization before, on the show. Um, but at the same time, 
she's no theologian, you know. Right. Um, but I kind of, I, I kind of get the kick. He said, you know, one side believes the Bible to be taken literally, the other side says not. So what, what kind of argument can you have? You know, Satan is real. No, it isn't. It's too. It's not. So, yeah, you know, yeah. I mean, and sometimes you know, but to be honest with you, sometimes I don't know if you ever, you know, sometimes you watch some of these shows when they have these, you know, these talking heads on there, and that's almost the kind of discussion that they they have. Mm-hmm. You know, I mean, uh, a lot of times that you know that's that's why I'm not too hip on these debate things. You know, uh, Dawkins and Zacharias, yeah, that probably they. I think it'd be interesting. I think it. I think. Yeah, if if Dawkins would would take off the Rottweiler stuff and you know, and, and would really try to deal with the arguments, um, you know, sometimes he he's not always that way. But well, but Zacharias well, could put him in his place on that too. <laughs> if you ever get a chance to listen to Ravi Zacharias, the guy is a genius. Wow, I mean he's he's got a radio show that's also available as a podcast called Let My People Think. And, mm. Yeah, it uh, it'll, it'll get you thinking. Um, I've never listened to it. I'm going to have to start now. Yeah, good stuff. So, good stuff. Uh, right after I'm done listening to what I'm doing now, but that's okay. Um, but maybe they could have made this debate into a song. And mm, got it. Go. See, <laughs> bad segue, folks. Really bad. I'm really reaching the night. Um. All right, we're down at Webster School in St. Augustine, Florida. And uh, we have uh, some parents that are suing the school because the third graders had to learn uh, a song by the country group Diamond Rio. And the song is called um, In God We Still Trust. And they said it interferes with the parents' right to raise children according to their own beliefs. Okay, now I can I can kind of address this one with a little bit of experience because when I was in high school, our school was sued by none other than Ann Gaylor Senior herself, um, the former president of the freedom from religion foundation who we have mentioned several times on the show. Mm -hmm. Um, and, uh, we were, our school was sued for because of singing a religious song. Now in our case, it was because we were singing it in the Capitol building in Madison (laughs) because it was uh, national schools week or something like that. And, uh, so we did a, a concert in the rotunda and, um, yeah, it wasn't much of a concert. We sang some songs, you know, I mean, but it wasn't like a big advertised thing. It was mostly because the director wanted to give us a chance to sing in uh, something that had the acoustics of a cathedral. And mm. that was about the only thing and, um, in, you know, available. And so we kind of combined it and we'd also recently lost a classmate in a car accident. So we kind of tied in some seatbelt safety stuff with it and everything. But one of the songs we sang was, um, uh, the Lord hath done it, which is, um, based on one of the Psalms. And so it wasn't even a specifically Christian song. Um, but it, you know, it was a Psalm and it said the Lord. So, um, uh, so she just happened to be in the building that day. <laughs> yeah, well, I'm sure they threw that one out. Anyway, um, generally, I'm on the side of the school board in these types of things. I generally believe that they're, um, <clears throat> especially when they talk about Christmas carols and things like that, that there is... You know, religious music is often historic music, and you know, if we're going to teach, you know, history, we have to teach, uh, teach it properly and with the religion in its proper place and things like that. So normally, I'd say about ninety percent of the time on the side of the school district, but not in this case. This this song is just so in your face. Well, this song isn't I mean, so much religious as it is political. Yeah, uh, yeah. Could be that, but I mean, you know, lyrics, you know, you place your hand on his Bible when you swear to tell the truth, 
His name is on our greatest document, document monuments. monuments, and all our money too. And when we pledge allegiance, there's no doubt where we stand. There's no separation. We're one nation under him. Um, I mean, it's uh, this. This. I mean, this is just yeah. It's it's kind of an in-your-face thing, if you ask me. It's and it is it, 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 by this country group, so there's nothing historical about it. Yeah, it's, I mean, it's, it's a based, current song. You know, um, I mean, you know, well, it is a different than than Lee Greenwood's. You know, God bless you, the USA. Sure. Um, yep. You know, they're they're again. I mean, this is just. Yeah, you're right. This is more political than it is religious. Yeah. See, okay. Yesterday, I was at uh, our solo and ensemble contest. All right, and I we I mean we were there. We we sat in on a lot of different stuff, not just um, what my daughter was in, and um, and we heard a lot of religious music. And this was all public schools. All right. Um, some of it was in English. A lot of it was in Latin. You know. Um, and from all different composers, you know, going way back, and some of it was more current or whatever. Um, but, you know, and all of, all of those things, and, and I was kind of thinking about this story as I was listening to these songs, and I was enjoying these songs, and, and you know, as a Christian, um, because these songs were Christian <laughs> songs, you know, I enjoyed them on a completely different level than someone else would enjoy them, all right? When, when we had this whole our school got sued and everything. Some of my friends, uh, in, in the choir that with me were atheists. Okay. And so I said, you know, how do you, how do you feel about this? And and they said, well, we like singing these songs. And, and, and I said, and, and I mean, these, not just atheists, but outspoken atheists. And, and, and so I said, you know, how, you know, you sing these songs and you, you sing them with feeling and everything. And they said, well, you know, we, when we sing these songs, we sing it from the perspective of the person who wrote it. You know, they say, I'm not singing this because this is what I believe. I'm singing this because it's what he believed. And, and so I try to, to capture the, the feeling that, you know, that went into it and, um, and into its composition. And, you know, in a sense that could be applied here. But, you know, I really think that there's a lot of songs you could sing, but yeah, this one, it really is pretty in your face, right? I guess the question kind of comes down to where do you draw the line? I mean, I had no trouble. I mean, there was, there was a court case uh, a few years ago, um, and they were going to sing Michael W. Smith's front, uh, you know, at a, at a high school graduation. Um, and, you know, it's a religious song. Granted, there's no historic, nothing historic about it, but again... I, I just thought, you know, I think to, to, to protest that song, you're going too far. It's, it's not, you know, it can be kind of understood as Christian. And it's Michael Smith, W. Smith definitely wrote it as Christian. But I mean, again, it doesn't say get real stuff. But this, I don't know. Maybe, maybe it's just the almost in your face attitude. I get that, that almost we're going to say, you know, we're we're going to talk about God here, whether you people like it or not. Yeah. Um, you know, I was, you mentioned Michael W. Smith. I was thinking about that song and it never mentions Jesus. It's a pretty <laughs> generic song. I mean, it, the only real reference to God is, you know, it talks about faith and love, but, um, not, you know, specifically about any particular faith. Um, and, and it says, um, in the father's hands, we know that a lifetime's not too long to live as friends, you know, so there's that reference to the father, but I mean, you know, that's not necessarily specifically Christian either. Um, uh, now, there was a comment on this story on our website. Um, and uh, it says uh, the subject of the comment was, First Christmas, now this. Uh, what's next? Parents forcing schools to 86 John Rutter's anthems. That composer is an atheist who writes Christian music. So I hate this political correctness. So I, you know, my only concern with this is if you, if you say, all right, this Christian music's okay and this Christian music's not okay. The problem is that courts don't tend to be real good at, um, common sense. 
that it's hard to legislate common sense and it's it's hard to word things in a way that common sense is going to prevail. It tends to be all or nothing just because it's easier to write. And so that's my concern with this. Uh, you know, how how is this going to I mean, hopefully the <sighs> I, you know, I don't even know how I'd like the court to rule on this. Because on the one hand, yeah, you know, I don't know. I think I'd, I'd want the court to say, well, um, you know, this really isn't good. And, and um, you know, the, it, there's there's much better songs that could be picked. Right. I, 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 but the fact of the matter, I think the court will dismiss it because... After the complaint was filed, or after somebody complained, I the, um, another parent complained, they cut the song. The school responded to your complaint. Right. Which leads to something else that we've seen before, that instead of going to the school, discussing it, and resolving it there, they took it to the court, which means now the school board has to pay all these court fees and everything, where instead of giving the money to the kids... You know, and providing for the kids' education, they have to waste all this money on this court stuff, all right? So the parents who decided to sue the school were not doing the kids any favors. I mean, they're hurting their own kids by doing this. So, you know, if your school does something that you disagree with, go and talk to the administration. You know, they tend to be pretty agreeable people, especially when it comes to moral kind of stuff. You know, the kind of things that are upsetting enough that you'd want to sue them about it. You know? So, yeah, they resolved it. So, pff, drop it. All right. Well, that 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 always uh, too bright. I and mean, that's where you kind of sit back and go, well, what do you want to do a lawsuit that we, we, you're going to lose? And in this particular case, I mean, based on, um, uh, um, you know, that, um, you know, uh, that because you made them learn this religious theme song, then you um, have interfered with the parents to raise children according to their own beliefs. Um, you can't even begin to make that argument. No, no. <laughs> Especially uh, since they live in St. Augustine. <laughs> yeah, well, but I mean, you just can't make that argument because the kids are, you know, because otherwise you're going to. Uh, the, again, you got to bring a broader principle here. The argument, um, you know, it interferes with the parents' right to raise children according to their own beliefs. So, at what? So, you're going to have, um, I don't know, 300 kids in the school. So, you're going to have 600 different parents setting the different things that that you're going to learn. Right. Well, yeah. I mean, my kids learn things in school that I don't agree with. Okay. So they come home, they tell me about it, and I talk to them about it. Yeah, right. Let me tell you something. This is, this is one of the advantages of having kids in public schools. And I'm not dissing on religious schools. I'm a big fan of them. Okay. Um, <clears throat> you know, if there were one around here, um, if there, I mean, if there were a Lutheran school around here, I'd have my kids in it. Okay. Um, but here's the reality. Kids in public schools, the advantage is they learn how to deal with the world. All right. My kids encounter all kinds of stuff, all kinds of teachings that they would not encounter in a Lutheran school. And on the one hand, it's great to, you know, to have them be taught in school the way they're taught at home. At the same time, they learn how to think, all right? My, my daughter just read, um, both angels and demons and the Da Vinci code. And <laughs> she said several times, she, she said angels and demons wasn't too bad. The Da Vinci code was horrible. Like she said, great story. I love the story, you know, and she's really into those, um, sort of, uh, you know, find the clues, uh, you know, conspiracies and cover ups and all that kind of stuff. She loves those kind of stories. Big fan of the national treasure movies and stuff. And, um, but she says, but there are so many times that Dan Brown just sort of goes off on these weird, bizarre, historical, alternate history kind of things. It's just, I just wanted to throw the book across the room or tear it up. <laughs> so, but you know what? 
I taught her how to think, you know, so that when she encounters this stuff, it doesn't shatter her, you know, understanding of reality. She stops and she thinks about it, you know, and whether that be in, in science class or whether that be in social studies. I mean, she's had um, teachers who are um, who have different political beliefs and sometimes their political beliefs, you know, extend into their teaching. And, and it made her very uncomfortable because she didn't agree with those. And, um, so, you know, she'd tell me about it and, you know, there was times where I said, look, if he does it again, tell me and I'll go talk to him, you know, but then they, it was like a new subject right after that and, and they got off it and then, you know, and then it didn't happen anymore. You know, so there's a time when the, for the parents to step in, but in that case, I wasn't going to sue the school. I was going to go talk to the teacher and say, Hey, you know, could you just keep your political comments to yourself and, you know, or, or else, you know, have somebody present the other side. So I, I firmly believe that school's job is to teach kids how to think, not what to think. So for that matter, I think that's a parent's job too. Well, I don't know. We conclude then with those wacky people in the UCC. <laughs> uh, what was it two weeks ago, a week or two ago, we talked about these guys? Well, okay, we talked about the Pope and um, and his comments yeah. on Africa and AIDS and condoms, and that yeah. the, the Pope said that um, the the condoms actually. Um, are a, a, a contribute to the AIDS problem um, because, and it was taken out of context. And we, so we talked about how that's not really what he meant. He, he was talking about changing hearts. Okay. So the UCC has an easier answer to the problem. <laughs> We're going to have condom distribution in church. <laughs> when will this insanity end? You just, you know, pass around two plates, one for the offering <laughs> where you put in a bunch of condoms and take one out. You know? So, um, I'm growing up, there was, you know, they had them in, you know, the bathrooms and the, the men's room and the, the gas station, you know, so this is much more. Yeah, I just, you know. Okay, now, first of all, this article. We, now, we need to understand this. This article is from Catholic News Agency. Okay? Right. So so we do need to put it in that context, okay? Obviously, Catholic News Agency is going to be against anybody distributing condoms, no matter who you are. Okay? Right, right. Uh, right. But but still, I mean, it, you know, it says, um, you know, this UCC executive Michael Schunemeyer said, the practice of safer sex is a matter of life and death. People of faith make condoms available because we've chosen life so that we and our children may live. Are you totally deranged? You know, what... You know, basically, then... There's nothing there talking about marriage. There's nothing there talking about, you know... About anything other than sheer biology. I mean, really, what what are we talking about here? Okay, they're not distributing them for the sake of married couples, Mm-mm. all right, who want to delay having children. Okay, because they're talking about matter of life and death. This is their HIV and AIDS network. Okay, so the church is telling people, look, you're gonna do it anyway, so at least do it safely. Right. right. Shouldn't the church be saying, "Don't do it anyway"? You're Christians. Well, again, this is this is this is you know extreme liberal Christianity. It's interesting. You talked about how you know they um, how it, it started. It had 2.1 million members in 1967, and now it's down to 1.2 million. I have a book uh, in my office by a, a UCC pastor, and I keep this book of sermons to remind myself never how to write a sermon. Well, I probably talked about this before. Mm-hmm. Okay. <laughs> you know, but, you know, he, he makes, yeah, like I said, yeah, he made the judge. Thank you for reminding me. But for those of you who haven't heard it before, out of the story of uh, Jesus healing the man born blind, 
he has a sermon against this is written in the 80s against capital punishment and in favor of nuclear freeze now why you would want to go to a, a church that that's that's the, the sermon and doesn't take you to the cross i don't know um <clears throat> Why anybody would want to publish a book of sermons like this, I don't know. Um, but that's that's this denomination. I had a – and probably – okay, you can hold up the mug here in case I said this one. Uh, my, I had a, a friend of mine who was looking for a church and went to the a UCC congregation, first church, and the sermon was, why you should join a union. Hey, yeah, have a few drinks. You know, okay, good. So <laughs> I had mentioned that one too. Um, but again, it, I can't remember this stuff, man. How many years have we been doing this? Uh, but almost three. I mean, the fact, almost three, but you know, the, 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 the key thing is, is that there's no gospel there. Nope. And so if there's no gospel, I mean, you know, there's not course, even law here, right? <laughs> so, well, of course up here, the UCC means Unitarian considering Christ. So, uh, you know, I mean, this is, yeah, did I tell you about the time I took like, all the evangelical kids down to the UCC church in Springfield? Yep. Yeah, you know, it's the same thing, and they're just blown away. What, is, what does this church believe? You know, it, it, it really it makes you nothing. appreciate what we have, you know? Right. I mean, you I, know, honestly, the only thing, the, go ahead. The only good thing you can say is that a lot of times, you know, and, and there are some churches that, you know, the it, you know, the UCC guy told me one time back in Springfield, he was very evangelical. They leave me alone and I leave them alone. Well, and that, they don't speak for me. Right. Our local UCC guy is practically, you know, I mean, except for his view of of the sacraments, um, uh, you know, he's he's basically uh, Missouri Synod Lutheran. I mean, he's just, he's very conservative. And, um, and so, you know, I, I've asked him about it several times and he says, we're congregational, you know, we have, you know, complete autonomy to teach whatever we want. And so I teach the Bible and I just ignore all that other stuff, you know? That's right. Yep. And a couple of the UCC people I went to school with told me the same thing. Uh, when I did with a Gordon Conwell. Um, I, I, I mean, they, they, they talked to Alan wisdom at the Institute for original and democracy, which was, um, the group that Richard John Nohouse started, uh, former Lutheran turned Catholic. And, you know, I, I really, you know, uh, um, I like his comment. He says, you know, condoms can be easily obtained at any corner drugstore. One would hope that a church would be offering some moral guidance not available in the drugstore. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, what do you, what are you going to church for? You know, and for that matter, Really, are, are, is somebody going to come? Now, I've had people come to my door because I live right next to the church. So it's real, and there's a sidewalk connecting our back door to the church. Okay, so it's really obvious that this is the parsonage. Okay, so often on Sunday afternoons, for some reason, uh, um, not sure why that is, but we live there's a the main business in town is a truck stop. Okay, and so I get people at my door every once in a while asking for a handout. Um, whether it be a tank of gas or a meal or, you know, or something else. Okay. And we've got a good network here, um, that we're, we're able to do that. Um, we have a fund for it and, um, we're able to, to provide for people and, uh, the way we have it set up, um, all the churches are in communication with each other with one central hub so that people can't just go from church to church and abuse them. Okay. I'm getting off the topic now, but, um, but I think it's a good idea if you don't have something like that in your area. Um, but while people will come to me and ask for gas or food or lodging, I'm really having a hard time imagining someone coming to a church and saying, <laughs> are, are you the pastor at this church? Yeah. Okay. Um, I met this woman and she's really <laughs> hot. Okay. And like, but you know, I want to be safe, so could you give me a condom? <laughs> I just don't see it happening, you know? <laughs> yeah, I don't know. Like I said, we went to some blind... I mean, a couple of ridiculous stories tonight. What can we say? Um, 
we had a couple of comments from a couple of different people this week. Um, why don't you do Carlos and I'll do um, uh, George. Okay. We actually have one more too. Oh, do we? Yeah. Yeah. There was, um, in fact, let's start with that one. And this was about the podcast in general. This is on our, if you go to crossfeednews.com slash podcast and, um, and you go down to the bottom of the page, there's a comment there, uh, which I really appreciated. Um, this is from AB. I don't know who that is. Um, says, love the concept of this webcast. I may even subscribe myself. I hope you did. If you did, let us know. Um, however, I do have a few suggestions. Watch the dead air. Your pace is a little slow. Um, I do try, you know, I put these little like sound effect things in there. Usually those are to fill dead air. Um, is, is why I put those in because it's, it's hard to, um, it's hard to edit the video and the audio and stuff. So, um, so that's how I do it. And I just kind of do a search through for anything more than a couple seconds. Um, I put it in there. So I don't know, maybe I need to, to search for smaller gaps or something like that. Um, the, the, the podcast seems a little slow because we're a little slow. Well, the, you know, the other thing is that I, Jim and I both do this. We'll, we'll kind of stutter and, and pause. And part of the reason for that is, um, and, and I, I suppose I speak for myself, but I, I imagine this is the same with Jim too. Um, we're sort of trained to choose just the right word to make sure that you come across very clearly and that people don't misunderstand you. And so it's sort of like, okay, what's the word I'm looking for? And, and kind of pause um, to find the right word. And that that's, you know, probably, you know, and, and he, he goes on, he says, I listen to and watch other podcasts like This Week in Tech Indignation. Um, you might want to check them out just to see the good pacing that they have. Um, Dignation, they have good pacing because they both get drunk on the show. <laughs> and they just... And, you know, and on a show like that, they can speak, you know, whatever, uh, well, actually, I, I take it back. More recent shows, uh, uh, Kevin Rose, the, the head of dig, um, he's, he's backed off cause he was just, he kind of hit rock bottom, you know? And so now he's more into drinking tea and stuff. I haven't watched recent episodes, but, um, this week in tech usually has like four or five people on it. Um, that helps too, but you know, on both on shows like that, they can just sort of speak off the top of their heads and, you know, they don't have to, they can say basically whatever they want and it's not going to have eternal consequences. And so we have to be a little more careful about what we say. Um, so that's, that's part of the problem with the pacing. You know, uh, I imagine if we didn't record this on, on like at night when we're exhausted, especially when like tonight where it's Sunday night and, um, you know, Jim, what time did you get up this morning? Um, 5.30. 5.30, okay, and it's 10 o'clock in, um, in Massachusetts now. So, you know, we kind of loopy uh, toward the end. Um, so I'm loopy all the time. <laughs> okay. So that's, you know, that's my excuse. I don't know. It's not really a good reason. It's just a good excuse. Um, the content of your conversations and website is good as well. Thanks for making this show with the spare time that you have amongst your pastoring. P.S. One more suggestion in the future. See if you can have people interact with in your website and not have the streaming video disappear. I was halfway through and voted only to have to reload to the point that I was at previously. Um, there is a, um, there's something you can click on instead of watching the, the player that's built in. Um, there is a, um, ah, I forget what it is, but there's, there's a place you can click that it'll pop out into a separate window. Um, so yeah, that's a problem, but we don't create our own player. It's one that I borrowed from the blueberry network. Um, so, uh, it's cause I'm not a JavaScript guy. If someone wants to design a, a great video, p uh, podcast player, that'd be awesome. We'd love you. Um, so, okay. So there was that one. Thank you very much for that comment. I'll do Carlos, then I'll let you do George. Okay. Uh, Carlos, uh, you said, is a Lutheran engineering prof in Canada, and uh, apparently he's been listening to our listen to your sermons, and apparently we come across our podcast then from you. He said, I like your final comment about the new dictionary definition of marriage in CrossFeed 122. Instead of addressing as the Holy Crusade, you recognize the dictionary is just reflecting the change in society happening around us. God has a clear definition of marriage, which we need to proclaim, but the dictionary needs to provide 
reflect the changing meaning of the world and the, the overall society. When I see the big activism in the church trying to halt the change in legislation to allow for same-sex marriage, I think about divorce. Maybe I connect the two because divorce was forbidden in Brazil when I grew up due to the strong Catholic influence, no doubt. During my youth, society and the church debated, and it finally legislation was passed authorizing filing for divorce after three years of judicial separation, meant to give the couples a chance for reconciliation. Many churches rallied during that debate. But some thoughtful pastors noted that, though God doesn't like divorce and only authorizes in exceptional cases, he himself legalized it in the brief period when he was the king in a left-hand kingdom. Jesus explained that God instituted this law in secular society because their hearts were hard, i.e. they were not all God's children. Our society hasn't changed much since that time. With that example, God showed that even a Christian ruler should not try to simply use the Decalogue to govern society which, if I recall correctly, uh, Calvin tried foolishly. In a democratic society where the citizens are given the authority when they vote, I think we Christian rulers can accept legalization of same-sex unions and even call them marriages if we think such a law is better than not having it, as God thought the certificate of divorce was in the case of the kingdom of old kingdom of Israel. Notice it didn't make divorce right in the eyes of God. Just my two cents I wanted to throw into the discussion. That was worth a whole lot more than two cents. So he he starts out saying that you know that that I was insightful, and then he offers a whole lot better insight than I offered. So, so. Carlos, really appreciate the comment. I mean, re just really well thought out. We've got you know, we've got uh, we've got the two ends of the spectrum watching our show. All right, we've we've got the people that watch this like on YouTube, especially. Um, that, and not all, I mean, some of our YouTube, uh, watchers I'm sure are very intelligent, but the people that tend to leave comments on YouTube, um, are not really demonstrating their intelligence. Um, and then we get comments like this, you know, we've got these just really bright, intelligent people watching our show. So, um, so I love them all, the, the YouTube people, cause they're entertaining and, um, the, uh, you know, sort of like watching, a um, uh, a frat movie. Um, but, uh, you know, then there's these just brilliant, uh, people that, that offer their comments. And, and this is why I love comments so much. Okay. This is number two reason. Number one, just lets me know that people are actually watching. Um, but, uh, I mean, yeah, I, I, I don't know. I, I'm going on and on trying to say that I really can't add anything to this. Be quiet and watch the film. Sorry. So, but I'll tell you, this is something I sure have been thinking about this week. So, and and I've been discussing it uh, with uh, some friends on Facebook and and stuff like that too. It, if you know, there's one thing about this kind of when this kind of stuff happens, this is a really cool opportunity to talk to people about what the Bible does say, and to talk to people about Jesus, which you know kind of brings me um to task too because um I've been discussing this stuff on Facebook. I haven't mentioned Jesus in the discussion yet. And uh, and I really need to do that. But <clears throat> you know, we have these opportunities uh whenever this stuff happens. This is this is like all of a sudden religion which is, you know, supposedly uh you're not supposed to talk about in mixed company. All of a sudden it's a water cooler topic. You know? So take advantage of that. There's your, your evangelism moment for the day, you know, um, you know, talk to people, see what they think, you know, and then talk about the, you know, our bridegroom, talk about Christ and, and the love that he has for us and the, the difference of what he offers us compared to what the world offers. But at the same time, we need to be compassionate. And I think that's, you know, really kind of what this is about is, is being compassionate to people and, and realizing that, um, you know, not everybody's going to agree with this because they just can't see it through the same eyes. Finished, Pinky. So then we got a note from, so again, Carlos, very, very, very thankful uh, for your comment. Really appreciate it. Love to hear more from you. Um, and then from George who were always appreciative of his comments. Uh, good session, guys. Dale did an excellent job of proclaiming the good news. 
Um, I hope you enjoyed the church mice. Oh, he he said <laughs> it's a great uh, comic. I'll, um, I'll I'll stick it at the end of the of the video thing. But it's uh it's it's these two mice that that go up to a um they're they're knocking on a mouse hole, you know, and it says we're here to talk to you about cheeses. <laughs> Okay. So yeah, that was awesome. It, it took me a second because it, it like hearing it, it, you know, it's really obvious. Um, but it's, it's not as obvious when you read it at first. Okay. Anyway, uh, kind of reminds me of Jehovah's witnesses or Mormon missionaries. They always travel about in pairs. I wish we had the freedom to do evangelism in America. Like we do in some of our foreign mission fields, being a foreign missionary really spoils a pastor in a very good way. In Africa, Liberia in particular, a pastor never does ministry alone. Members of the congregation go with you on pastoral visits, and they share in prayer and the bringing of spiritual healing. Spiritual community is a very real thing in the churches there. I often said to the people, you don't need us as missionaries as much as the church needs you to come as missionaries to us. God bless. My one daughter, Ruth, who's a senior at seminary, says Lutherans are the grace people. Hey, your uh, little tribute to Davy and Goliath at the tail end of the podcast was fitting. Thanks. So I stuck um, the, uh, that, I found that Mountain Dew commercial and I stuck it at the end. So. Um, was that what got us pulled from YouTube? Because I said something copyright violation in there. Oh, uh, no, no, no. That was, um, oh, that was that, that Sarah Palin, um, um, that that speech she gave at that church where she talked about witchcraft and and stuff oh. like that, um, I had yeah I had inserted that that video clip because we were talking about it personally I think it was fair use it was um a Google video pulled that episode, um I I thought it was fair use because we were commenting on it and that's part of fair use law, um, but uh, they, you know they've got this uh software that basically just runs through looking for duplicates and and if it finds a duplicate it just automatically flags it and pulls it they don't have a a human you know review board or anything like that but i don't have time to fight it and i don't think it's all that important i've got you know more important fights to fight so um i'm not going to worry about it so it's Uh, still up on youtube so Um, anyway, George, again, thanks for the comment. Uh, I think it's interesting, uh, you know, because I've had friends of mine going not to uh, Liberia, but to uh, Kenya. And they talk about uh, the, the same thing that you experienced, that, you know, everybody really gets into the ministry together. But, of course, it said, you know, like one pastor will have like three churches and he'll have to walk you know, 40 miles between each one. So, um, you know, so a lot of times that I, I think that people really do need to do that work. Uh, we in America so often we are we are professionalized, and mm-hmm. you know so, and and really shouldn't be. Um, and I hope your daughter does well in seminary. Uh, you know, I've um, not all, okay. Not all women go to um, to seminary to be pastors, but I'm assuming since George George is an ELCA pastor, that that's why his daughter is there. Um, in the Missouri Synod, we don't believe um, that women should be pastors, but at the same time, and I've said this before, um, even though I, I can, I don't believe that it's God will, God's will for women to be pastors. I do believe that God can work through women who are serving in a pastoral position. Um, so, so you know, it's it's sort of like uh, it's it's sort of like the this whole thing where uh, Rush Limbaugh is saying, and some others are saying, I hope that, um, that Barack Obama fails. Why? If he fails, the whole country fails, all right? Whether you like him or not. And, um, you know, and, and the same goes with, uh, um, with a woman pastor. I don't want her ministry to fail because if, you know, I want her to, to bring the gospel to people, even if she's doing it in a way that I don't agree with. So... Um, I, I, you know, I like the comment though about, uh, the pastor having someone along with them. All right. I've had on different pastoral calls that I've gone to, I've had elders come along with me and that is great. All right. It's not always possible. Um, just because, you know, they're working during the day and I'm out during the day and just, you know, it's, it's a bit of a hassle to try to align schedules and all that kind of stuff. But if I'm going out and doing a visit, and you know, sometimes it's just a casual, you know, member visit or whatever, 
Um, but having an elder along, it's just, it's really great because, you know, for one, it just keeps the sort of conversation flowing a little better. Some visits, you know, some visits, like, I know that I'm going to have a hard time getting out of there because the person is very talkative. That's great. Um, you know, then I don't have to try to keep the conversation going. Uh, at the same time, there's other ones where I know that, you know, that person's not real talkative and it's, you know, it, then the, um, you know, I've got to make sure to keep the conversation going along. But, you know, the, besides that, you know, the other thing is that it's an opportunity for that layperson, and it doesn't even need to be an elder. Uh, you know, it could be anybody. Um, and, but it's, it's an opportunity for that person to, um, to experience, um, say, you know, okay, go out and visit other members, you know, of our church and, and share Christ's love with them. And, and to see that, no, this isn't a, this isn't a threatening thing. It's a, it's just a comfortable, you know, casual thing. And, and, um, you know, and, and it's very enjoyable and, um, it, you know, it, do it like if you're doing like a shut in visit or something like that. So pastors, I'll kind of encourage you to, um, to do this, to invite your, your members to come along with you on visits. Now, obviously some visits, it wouldn't work. Okay. Um, but a lot of times if you're just doing, you know, casual member visits, you know, bring someone along with you. It just, it just helps build the community, you know? So, um, you know, and, and definitely, um, uh, going out and visiting members of the church should not be just the pastor's job. You know, I and mean, we've got people that go out and they're not, um, you know, appointed or anything or elected or anything like that. But we've got people that just in their free time, go visit our shut-ins and stuff like that. And, you know, they appreciate that so much. So, um, so yeah, that's a great idea. Um, something else that we can learn from the African churches. <laughs> so, but we would love to hear from you. And, um, not only people that uh, haven't written us, people that have to, um, we'd love hearing from our viewers and listeners. You can, uh, send us an email at podcast at crossfeednews.com. Uh, or, you know, depending how you're watching this, sometimes there's places to post comments and, or a link to click on for an email address and, and all kinds of stuff. So, um, we would absolutely love to hear from you. Um, if you don't want us to share your comment on the show, let us know that too. You know, we'd be, if you have questions about something, but you don't want it to be, um, you know, broadcast out to every nation in the world. Um, that's fine. You know, just let us know and, and we won't. Um, but you know, we, we do enjoy reading your stuff on the show, uh, so that we can talk about it. So, so big thanks to everybody that wrote us. Big thanks to everyone who's listening and watching. And mm -hmm. um, have a very blessed Easter. Yes. Oh, and I have to, I have to say this: we we just I just watched for the first time uh, the Veggie Tales and Easter Carol. Right. If you have not watched this, go see it. This is now my favorite Veggie Tales video, and I've seen most of them. Okay. Um. I mean, I I get a lot of them free from Big Idea. Okay. <laughs> This one I hadn't. We got it from Netflix, and oh, it is awesome! It is awesome. Easter means no more death. That's the the theme of it, and it's just it's great. Whether you're an adult, whether you're a kid, I don't care. Go watch it. Okay, it's great. It's it's entertaining, and uh, and it's had a, just a wonderful message. So, but if even if you don't get to see it, you know, really, I wish you had a very blessed Easter, and and remember that, yeah. Easter means no more death. We celebrate Easter because Christ is risen from the dead, which means we're going to rise one day too, to live forever with him. Bless Easter, people. We'll see you in a couple weeks. Yep. Good night, everybody. God bless you.